Welcome back, Vinyl Community. Special episode for you today. I'm going to be looking at my hip-hop collection. Inspired by my recent uh, Fiennes haul. You may have seen in another video. What you hear is not a test. That's a tune called Rapper's Delight that appeared in 1979 on the Sugar Hill Records label. This is a 12-inch single, extended mix. This was would be the first uh, many outside the boroughs of New York would hear of a new musical phenomena called hip-hop. This song actually heavily sampled Sheik's Good Times with the bass line and the chorus and uh, added rapping over the top. Hip-hop actually had its origins in the New York boroughs, particularly the Bronx. Uh, DJs like uh, Cool Herc was one of the first. Many from a Caribbean background, Herc was born in Jamaica, inspired somewhat by the, uh, the Jamaican sound system culture there, particularly the large open-air dances, uh, the clashes between rival sound systems, where they would, have, uh, they would battle for musical supremacy over uh, who had the most exclusive records, and you would have artists get up and talk over the records. He began setting up a similar kind of what were, became known as block parties in, the, in New York. Uh, he began developing the art of turntablism, uh, cutting and scratching between uh, two different copies of the same record, particularly focused on uh, records that had a drum solo, what became known as a drum break. He would uh, cut and scratch between those and prolong the break, this attracted crowds, and uh, specifically those who uh, who came to dance to those breaks. They became known as uh, B-boys or B-girls after break, break boys or break girls. And thus, became, uh, thus began kind of the foundations of hip-hop. Once this started making it to records, it became known as sampling. And one of the, the most, not the first rap tune to make it to record, but one of the most influential ones was Rapper's Delight which sold over two million copies worldwide and put uh, hip-hop on the map and started uh, the explosion that uh, still continues today. Many of the building blocks of hip-hop were uh, records that were uh, sought out for sample material, like uh, some of the most famous ones were It's Just Begun, Jimmy Castor Bunch. These are tunes that would be sampled over and over again. Also, uh, The Winstons. This has got uh, Amen Brother, which became known as the Amen Break, heavily sampled, and perhaps none more notorious than the Apache Break, based on a Cliff Richard song, as done over by the incredible Bongo Band, and appearing on the Pride label, heavily, heavily sampled in hip-hop. The Sugar Hill Gang jumped on this. They were not really a real group at the time, they were more of an ad hoc studio uh, crew put together by um, by uh, Sugar Hill Records, founded by Sylvia Robinson. Uh, the Sugar Hill Gang would go on to release the debut LP, which contains Rapper's Delight. Now, rap was still very new at this time. This isn't fully rap. It's a mix of singing and rapping, which these guys could actually really sing. I was pretty, uh, pretty impressed when I got this. But uh, the group kind of solidified into uh, Wonder Mike, Master G and Big Bank Hank. Reportedly, the lyrics to Rapper's Delight was, um, was composed by Grandmaster Kaz. Got, uh, got them swiped, didn't get credit or compensation, reportedly. Also got Eighth Wonder by the Sugar Hill Gang. Further hit for them. As uh, the success of Sugar Hill Records went on, they expanded to the female group, The Sequence. Again, this is a mix of hip-hop and funk. They weren't putting all their eggs in one basket at this point. Now, these early rap tunes were, uh, were heavily party-oriented. Uh, basically, like uh, hip-hop kind of synthesized elements of um, R&B, funk, of course, but also some more disparate elements like um, electronic, 
specifically uh, groups like uh, Kraftwerk from Germany, also Latin music. These New York boroughs were kind of a melting pot of uh, black, Latino, various cultures coming together and uh, fusing a new kind of underground street form. Disco, very influential as well. Like I said, that Rapper's Delight heavily sampled Sheik's Good Times. But uh, the potential of this music to, uh, to go beyond the party tunes and to start to become a socially conscious movement was realized with a, a group called Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five in the early 80s released a song called The Message. It's their LP featuring that. You can see hip-hop culture, street culture fully in place there. The Ghetto Blasters. And this was followed up by The Message 2, which was uh, just featured Melly Mel and Duke Booty, two of the main uh, main rappers that appeared on the original message. Grandmaster Flash split with with uh, Sugar Hill Records. The group kind of carried on, fronted by Melly Mel, released a further hit called White Lines, which was uh, about the cocaine epidemic then in New York. Uh, I've actually read Melly Mel has admitted he was actually high on cocaine while he was in the studio recording the White Lines Don't Do It part of the song. Soon uh, films celebrating this new street culture started coming out like Beat Street again featuring Melly Mel and the Furious Five. Sugar Hill Records still in the early 80s continuing its dominance of the new uh, the new hip hop form, also wild style. It wasn't just music; it was a culture that went along with it. The dancing by the the B girls and B boys became known as uh, break dancing. That style of uh, of street street dancing, uh, graffiti part of the the culture, clothes, of course, the attitude. But as uh, rap exploded. Uh, of course, many other artists, many other labels started getting in on the act. Uh, several years ago, I picked up um, some compilations put out by uh, Tough City Records called Old School Flava. One of the influential rappers who uh, reportedly wrote the lyrics to Rapper's Delight was Grandmaster Kaz. Rare and unreleased old school hip hop, 86 to 87, on the Old School Flava label. Most of these came out, in, this one came out in 2006. Some of these compilations came out in the 90s originally. Uh, Grandmaster Kaz, Kaz was a member of the Cold Crush Brothers as well. It appears on this compilation. Fresh, fly, fresh, wild, fly and bold. Complete studio recordings. Double LP. Another influential early rapper, Spoonie G. School Flava, The Undefeated Three, Output, this isn't, isn't strictly hip-hop, it's more uh, R&B, but definitely has a little bit of rapping on there, a little bit of uh, definitely kind of those electro-influenced early hip-hop beats. And Captain Rock. To the Future Shock, Hip Hop and Electro, 1982 to 1985. Last one on the old school flavor label. This is more in the uh, the early hip hop tradition of turntablism, which of course was made famous by uh, another pioneering early DJ. Interestingly, in hip hop, the uh, the guy manning the turntables is called the DJ. And, and actually spinning the records. In uh, the Jamaican sound system culture, the guy that gets up and raps over the records is called the DJ, which in hip hop is called the MC or Master of Ceremonies. Of course, African Bombada, Planet Rock, the album. Influential uh, turntablist piece, 1986. And also found a while ago, 12 inch single. I think that was a thrift find for me. Not all that long ago. Another influential early rapper, Curtis Blow. Of course, it's got his big hit, The Breaks, on here. Got that on 12-inch as well. 
That one is 1980, very early one. Soon there was, a, I guess what you would call a second wave of wrappers. It began expanding out of uh, the Bronx neighborhoods, uh, popularized by Cool Herc and, and those other early DJs, DJs. One of the most popular, of course, that took hip-hop to a whole new level as the video era of MTV donned Run DMC from Queens. They fused uh, rock guitars into their big hits, uh, King of Rock, Rock Box, crossing over into the uh, outside of the strictly hip-hop uh, market and trying to cross over into the rock arena as well. Run DMC. Michael Jackson, of course, was doing much of the same thing uh, with his uh, Beat It hit. Sorry, phone's ringing. Another influential early rapper who was a member of the Treacherous Three, Cool Modi. This is his debut. I showed this in my uh, haul. How You Like Me Now. This was one of my favorites by him. It's got his hit Wild Wild West, which was uh, uh, one of the early ones I was into. I'll get into my personal history in just a minute. Cool Modi, Knowledge is King. It's got another one I used to like by him, I Go to Work. Of course, it soon, hip hop soon started getting into a pop element, or more of a crossover, uh, kind of top 40 crossover. DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. Of course, many uh, video hits on there. Now, uh, I first became exposed to hip-hop, uh, I guess, around the late 80s. Uh, back then, it was pre-internet. There wasn't really an easy way to find out about this music. Uh, there were a couple of the early uh, compilations I picked up were called um, Rap Tracks. There was a Volume 1 and a Volume 2. I had those on cassette. I'd, I'd started buying records in the early 80s. By the time I got into hip-hop, I'd switched to uh, cassette. So I had no uh, hip-hop on vinyl back then, but I, I was buying it on, hip, on um, cassette. And uh, the rap track comp compilations had uh, a mix of quite pop-oriented stuff, like, um, like DJ Jazzy Jeff, like Rob Bass and DJ Easy Rock. But it also included some more uh, authentic stuff. That was the first time I heard uh, Boogie Down Productions, BDP, KRS-One, also known as The Teacher. And they had a, a tune called... Uh, uh, what was it called? My Philosophy, which is on this album from them, By All Means Necessary. This is a much more authentic, gritty, street-level, um, socially conscious era of hip-hop, which began in um, with the, the release of The Message and started building through the 80s. Another group that I first heard on the Rap Tracks compilations was uh, Public Enemy, with their tune, Don't Believe the Hype. And uh, these are ones I definitely had on cassette at the time. It takes a nation of millions to hold us back. These are absolute rap classics, of course. Game changers in terms of production and sound with the, the Bomb Squad production. And, of course, Fear of a Black Planet. Spike Lee's movie, Do the Right Thing. Again, you see this connection between film and hip-hop. Redhead Kingpin and the FBI did the theme song for that, Do the Right Thing. Don't hear much about them these days. And the LP, Shade of Red. Uh, more uh, also socially conscious movement of uh, a next generation of rappers came out. Queen Latifah was one representing the females. All hail the queen. Very socially conscious, socially responsible type of... Um, of rap, but also at the same time there was a growing uh, element that celebrated uh, the darker side, the gangsta culture. Ice-T, of course, was one of the uh, the pioneers of that. I had a little bit of him on cassette, I think. Don't have much on vinyl right now. Did find uh, I'm Your Pusher, the 12-inch single, in a thrift not, not that long ago. Samples uh, Curtis Mayfield's Pusher Man. World Class Wrecking Crew. World Class, featured uh, a member called uh, Dr. Dre, became a little bit uh, famous later after that, when he, uh, he joined a group called NWA. NWA Straight Outta Compton was a huge album for me. I had it on cassette. Uh, first heard the video on um, 
Much Music, which was Canada's version of MTV. That was a, a clean version of the song, of course. I, I must have kind of known what I was getting into when I, I bought the cassette, because I remember waiting till the house was empty before I played it for the first time, and I remember sitting there being kind of... Uh, uh, blown away by the level of profanity and uh, and violent lyrics and stuff, but uh, I soon kind of got used to it and grew to enjoy the album. And uh, I spent many many times driving around with that on my uh, Alpine deck in my first car. Had to have an Alpine deck because that was what they always talked about in the the hip hop songs. So I definitely was was checking for the gangster rap at the time. Had all the straight the N.W.A. stuff. I had uh, Ice Cube. Uh, America's Most Wanted and the Kill at Will EP on cassette. I had this little uh, tape box of cassettes. I remember um, at one time we had some of my my uncle and uh, some of my young cousins. There was he had four kids. Uh, not to get too much into uh, family history, but uh, they came from kind of a, a gritty high crime area. Their parents split up. The kids uh, stayed with the dad. They moved into our uh, our basement for a while. It was my mom's. Uh, brother so she was trying to kind of help them out and uh, they were they were in high school at the time I was a little bit older so they found my tape case one time and it was kind of hard for me in those days to find out much about hip-hop like like I said it was before the internet you didn't have this access to information but they were right up on it they knew all this stuff they were like oh NWA you've got this they were blown away but uh, one thing I noticed was uh, they were very um I was a little bit older, so I was kind of able to discern between image and reality as far as the records. Like, uh, one of them made a comment that, uh, oh, they were so glad Ice Cube was out of jail for the drive-by shooting, which I'd, I'd read some interviews and I knew that that was not the case at all. That didn't happen. What happened on those records was, was made up, was fictional. But they kind of uh, didn't have that level of discernment yet. Uh, but they were big into their, their hip-hop at the time. It was kind of a sad story. The, uh, the Straight Outta Compton album was very influential in my area. It grew and grew over the next year or two. Soon you had these, uh, in my kind of rural area, you would have these kids running around in full Raiders gear trying to get into petty crime and stuff. And uh, one of my uh, young cousins, who was uh, probably about 15 or 16 at the time, he uh, got in with these guys. We kind of lost touch with uh, them after a while. They moved out. But at some point after that, he uh, he got in with these guys, got into some uh, some bad drug situations, uh, and at one point took a uh, a, a heavy beating, uh, got some permanent brain damage, and uh, I've run into him since. He's still uh, he's kind of like a child in a, in an adult's body, so that was kind of a tragic situation. But uh, the two girls in the in the family, two uh, sisters, they they turned out well. Both have uh, happy homes and have done well in life. Another hip-hop one that was, uh, they were kind of protégés of Above the Law, or NWA rather, was Above the Law. 12-inch single, Murder Rap. I think they were produced by Dr. Dre. I had their debut album on cassette. I've never been able to find that since. But, um, sorry, phone again. But uh, definitely been looking for that one. And a very a different sound from NWA. Very sample-heavy, less profanity. So I quite enjoyed that one. So that's kind of my history with hip-hop, guys. Hope you enjoyed. It was uh, quite an influential period of my listening. Got me uh, out of uh, listening to the strictly like top 40 stuff, which I'd gotten bored with. It seemed like a very vapid, plastic kind of dance music was, uh, was all the rage in the late 80s, early 90s. And this was music that was a bit more authentic. It meant more to me. And uh, as the 90s... As it went into the 90s, I kind of lost touch with hip-hop, drifted away from it. But uh, soon after that, I started getting into reggae, which I think I got uh, much of the same uh, feeling of it being an expression of something rather than just music created for entertainment. So that was how hip-hop was quite influential on me. So hope you enjoyed, guys. Thanks for watching, and cheers.